County Board is now in session. Well, welcome everybody to our FY 2025 budget wrap up work session. And I'm joined here by all my colleagues, Louis Gary Chair. And before we get into this work session, we need to finish up uh, a vote that we held open at our last closed session because Mr. DeFranti had to leave early. I have four ayes, but we wait your vote and I will read to you one more time the motion. I move that the members of the county board certify that at the just concluded closed session, one only public business matters, lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under chapter 37, title 2.2 .2 of the Code of Virginia, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered by the board. It was seconded, it was voted, except for your vote. How do you vote, Mr. DeFranti? Aye. Thank you very much. And that closes out that session. I believe we've done that properly. Nobody's saying any differently. All right, on to our work session. <laughs> Welcome. Um, we're, this is, uh, as I think folks know, this is our time to ask any remaining questions that you really need answers for before you feel like you can vote next, next week and work through our markup session on Tuesday. We're not making any final decisions today. We're not voting. But we are getting all of our final questions out. Um, and before that, though, we're going to meet with our Fiscal Affairs Advisory Commission, who has joined us and has been working diligently looking at the budget and sending us information, but coming here today to talk with us and sort of any summary comments, questions, comments they'd like to make. Ms. Burgess. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for the opportun opportunity per to present on behalf of the Fiscal Affairs Advisory Commission. I wanted to start first with performance measures. We really appreciate the direction from the board and the efforts of staff and the county manager to improve the performance measures in this proposed budget. FACT studies the proposed county budget every year. And every year we face the task of balancing varying programs and, and priorities, as you all do as well. Quality performance measures can make it clear which programs are most effective, and we do have multiple programs that address similar issues. And, we, and good performance measures can help, it, help make clear which of those programs are most effective. And then when paired with targets in our comprehensive plan, performance measures can also help us balance between the competing priorities we have in our community. So, for many, many years, FAC has requested and, and recommended that the county improve its performance measures to be more targeted to help us um, to help us make better decisions on the budget. And this year, a subcommittee has done a lot of work, and we've included a detailed report on performance measures in our wrap-up report. It's the last half of the report. It's also included online for anyone listening. I think the wrap-up report is both on the FACTS website and attached to this meeting. And again, we really appreciate, we know how hard it is to work on performance measures just from the outside, so we really, really appreciate the manager and staff for putting in all this work. So, as I said, the commission is tasked with advising the board on budgetary issues, and operating budget season is our March Madness. This year, we did a deep dive into eight different departments, and we discussed the budget comprehensively. Staff was very generous in their time, both meeting with our subcommittees doing the deep dives and in answering uh, our follow-up questions. Thank you very much to staff. Bless you. <laughs> we submitted pre-work session reports to the board with topics we thought warranted further discussions, and we appreciate that many of those discussions, that many of those topics were addressed in the work sessions, and some of our, our questions were answered after in emails with staff. I wanted to highlight just two areas that would be helpful for us to have more information. One, um, and this is not the fault of staff that we don't have this information, but one is uh, the police department continues to have serious vacancy issues, and it has for many years. It would be helpful to better understand what the police department has been trying and what has worked, what has not worked, and come up with some more creative ideas. For example, have we worked with the career center to, be to develop a pipeline between our high school students and who might eventually want to become our police officers? The second one is the fire department has seen a spike in turnover in the last couple of years, and that was uh, unexpected. It's a new trend, and it happens to coincide with the completion of the transition to the Kelly Day. Um, it would be helpful to understand whether this is just a coincidence, where the turnover is coming from, and if it's the beginning of a trend that we should start working to address. So. 
drum roll please onto the big FAC recommendations. And again, um, all of those pre-work session reports and some future considerations that we talked about are all in that report, which is online and which has been provided to the board. So the commission committee uh, considered various changes to the manager's proposed budget, some of which came out of our deep dives or our read on the budget, and some of which came from listening to the board work sessions. We've listened to all of them. They're on YouTube. You can watch them at double speed. And, uh, and listening to the public hearings. Um, the commissioners were acutely aware that any increase in the tax rate increases the, burdens, the burden on households above and beyond the, burden, the tax burden caused by in -state, increased real estate values. That was very much front of mind for all of us. We also briefly considered the aggregate transfer to Arlington Public Schools. The commission found the proposed APS budget to fall short of the model of clarity and transparency that we are used to in the county budget. And we also noticed that the APS budget lacks performance, <laughs> doesn't lack quality performance measures, it lacks any performance measures or many performance measures. So thus, we didn't dive into this issue at this time, but we do hope to work with APS's budget, budget advisory committee to do some joint work in the future. So. Aggregating the increases and the decreases that the majority of the commission supported led to a recommendation that the county board adopt a tax rate that the manager initially proposed, which translates to a 1.5 cent increase. All of our votes are included in our final report, which is available online, so I'm just gonna touch on the votes that the majority of the commission supported. So increases, we support an increase of the funding for the prevention efforts for teen behavioral and mental health issues to an aggregate of $2 million. This could include after school programs, possibly programming at nature centers, um, more things at the libraries, and transportation solutions to ensure the kids can actually take advantage of the programs. We do not recommend specifically how this should be allocated. We are thinking this would be a bucket of money that the manager, that originally could go to the manager and then as it's determined that it should go to a different department that could be worked out in the future. We also support maintaining the behavioral intervention services program. As this seems to be a critical program that wouldn't be adequately replaced through programs through the school system, because that program seems to address the caregivers and to have a, to be a really good investment. And then finally, we support adding a position within DMF to focus on performance evaluation. We think that having someone in DMF relatively neutral to the individual departments that are being overseen would help promote discipline within the budget. And we know that having someone who's expert in performance evaluation would also be useful for evaluating and address, addressing the structural deficit in the APS budget, which we've all discussed looking at closely this summer. On the decreases side, the commission supported reducing the paving budget by $500,000, uh, safe streets over smooth streets. And uh, that really is looking at where our PCI is, where it has been. It seems like it's, it's higher than it needs to be and in a constrained budget environment. We're thinking it, that that investment could be pulled back some. We also uh, supported reducing the investment for publicly available EV charging by 400,000. So the investment would be 100,000. We think uh, the larger investment is premature right now, given the number of EV chargers we see in the county and the usage that we have for those, those EV chargers. But we do look forward to the carbon neutral transportation plan and further de demand analysis that supports future in investment. And we also were cognizant of leaving some investment to help distribute the EV chargers that are there today to, to fill in some of the holes. And then uh, for those doing the math, this, uh, those increases and those decreases led to a, a little bit more than what was proposed. And so to make up the difference, the fact supported reducing the one-time contribution to the Affordable Housing Investment Fund um, by the amount needed to balance the budget, which was by our math approximately 635,000. 
of the proposed 10 million one-time contribution. The commissioners think that this relatively small decrease is warranted to address the teen mental health crisis. We really saw this money is going over there. Um, there was some concern about uh, making living more expensive in Arlington for many to, um, to fund the ability of a few to live in the county through these direct subsidies. And many commissioners expressed an opinion that housing is an important issue that we need to address, but that streamlining and simplifying the process of approving new housing developments was preferable to direct subsidies. And then if I have one second, we do have some vacancies out there on fact. So if you are at home listening to this, I encourage you, you are probably the type of person who would enjoy <laughs> joining us on these conversations, and I promise that it is enjoyable. So please reach out to us, and we would love to have you join the commission. Excellent. A report, a PSA. This is great. Thank you very much. All right. I know. Um, but a couple more. Co colleagues, any I have a few sort of comments in general, but I'll, I'll see what, if colleagues have got some questions for you, Ms. Burgess. Burgess um, any questions for our FAC? Uh, yes, for the FAC or about the FAC recommendations? Um, well, I, I was thinking they were one and the same. Okay. Just ask a question. Yes. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> on the um, paving recommendation, I know uh, we had a, a great set of conversations um, about this during the work sessions. Um, might someone be able to comment on pros and cons and scale of cutback? It could also be offline. We have until Tuesday. We have all kinds of time. You're going to have to repeat that question because I was. You were smirking. I, no, no, I was giving the the I tractor beam to Michelle to get her to come sit next to me. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Welcome, Michelle. Yeah, the question was, one of FACT's recommendations was to um, embrace the one upside of climate change, that uh, the roads are not frozen and thawed as often, and might we reduce uh, paving? And I, I know we had a great conversation about how hard we've worked to get that paving index back up. Um, maybe just share a little bit about Yeah, so my, my thoughts on that generally, I'm, unfortunately, I am so scarred from the, the community surveys we've done every four years that talk about that is really the number one metric that people look at is the quality of our roads. And having the PCI above 80 actually is, is a good thing. I think that um, we have been careful not to overinvest in it. The challenge we still have, and I know Jillian, you know this, is that we have also these construction projects that are going on at the same time that still tend to tear up the road. So I actually think our investing in our roads that get it above 80 sort of balances out when we have all this construction going on. Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't be the first place I would go to cut. That's just my reaction. Mm -hmm. all right. Any other I mean, comments? I, all right. I actually, I, I, if, oh, Mr. On Friend. this topic? Yeah. Sure. Because help me, because I was ready to ask a question on paving because Mark, I, I think you'll remember I was sort of, and Michelle probably too, I was paving obsessed last year. I was like, could we find any savings there? Because I did not live through the glory of the, of the, the. But if we keep going in this direction, you will. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think that the budget actually reduces the paving budget somewhat, yeah. and. Not insignificantly, and so that's why I ended up not asking the question. And I'm wondering, I see head nods on that, and that may put it back eventually to fact, too, to see if you guys talked about that at all. But I think maybe it's first to Michelle. Or so Michelle. I think that's right. I think we are also, um, I don't think we're overly concerned, but construction inflation, right, and the effectiveness of you know what I mean, as costs go up, what are we doing? I think we are trying, and Jillian, I know we're not perfect on this, we uh, you know, acknowledge this. I think when we're looking at our paving program, can you guys hear me? I can't. Yeah, we can, yeah. we can, sorry. Yep. sorry. Um, we're trying to incorporate you know, different markings, bike lanes, other things. When we're repaving, we're not just repaving as is, we're trying to take into account multimodal. I don't think we're perfect but I think we're getting better. I also think we're getting better at engagement on how we're doing some of those um, redos of, of, if you will, when we're doing a repaving project with coordination. It's not perfect. And then sometimes we get a lot of negative feedback, I'm just gonna say, because 
look at the Wilson Boulevard project, right, where we narrowed a lane, you know, in order to incorporate more bike lane and pedest not so much pedestrian stuff. Um, so we're trying to be smarter with those paving dollars. And, and so I think it's like road condition versus just paving, do you know what I mean? And there's, we're trying to get more multimodal. Do we have it right completely? No way. But are we getting better? Is it incremental? I think that's what our long-term long -term objective is. I, ho I hope that's helpful. But I, I, I do, we are still worried though about inflation big time on construction. We really are. And so when you try, try to work that through, that's, that's part of what we're, we're doing, if that's helpful. Super helpful. Is there just, I don't know, Jillian, if you had additions to the to thoughts on that or the discussion that you guys had on the cut or the recommendation? So I think the, the overall discussion in, in the commission is that our roads are smoother than they need to be. <laughs> um, that, you know, they're, they're great. But you know, I think everybody has an example of this road that was just fine, and it got milled and, and um, resealed, and it that one, you know, like that one seemed like a waste. This one seemed like a waste. Like it, it just seemed a little premature. And uh, not that any one road is a good, any one street is a good example because there's lots of stuff happening beneath the street that we can't see. So there, there may have been other reasons. I think. Where this recommendation comes from is it was our understanding that the reduction in the proposed budget is more a reflection of the reality that you ch that we had been uh, budgeting more for the winters we had been seeing and then saving each time. And so this sort of baked those savings in. So in other words, we had been budgeting for an 84-ish PCI, which is where we are. Um, and we'd been achieving the 80, 83, 84 PCI with fewer dollars, so the proposed was full, fewer dollars. I think what FAC was saying is, we can probably live with an 80 PCI. And you know we're at 83, we're, we can probably go down a bunch. We didn't, within FAC, discuss the, um, the multimodal uh, transportation changes, but I, I have heard DS, DS say, for example, that they don't prioritize um, the repaving schedule based on those roads that are scheduled to get multimodal updates. So it seems like it, that's, that's not a primary goal of the repaving program. The repaving program is about repaving the roads. Um, it's just when we happen to be able to also make updates. So if, we're, if, if the goal is to make streets safer, either that should be a goal of the repaving program and things should be prioritized that way, or we should spend the money making the streets safer. Um, Wilson Boulevard Project is a good example of one where, yes, bike lanes were put in, but those aren't the bike lanes that were called for in, in the master transportation plan. So they sort of fell short of the, what the comp plan actually calls for. And it was said, because this is not a safety project, this is a repaving project, and we're, we're willing to go halfway or you know, part of the way to make it safer. So um, some would argue even that, that what was put in was more about pedestrian safety by pulling the cars away from the pedestrians and less about bike safety, since there's no barrier between the cars and the bikes. All right, Tagus. Uh, so on this, I remember that we had this conversation before. Um, I always understood our policy as being trying to balance the, the maintenance so that we don't have to lag behind or have to catch up, et cetera, right? I mean, when, when we calibrate the, the investment so that we don't fall behind and we don't have to catch up at a far higher uh, expense later, so the per mile or so, that's definitely part of it. When we had funded paving at $2 million a year, how many years ago, the catch up was incredibly expensive and we couldn't do it. So it's one of those things, yeah, with infrastructure, when you fall behind, you fall behind, right? So to your point, I the think- The question is, where do we assess the risk of falling behind? So if we say, for example, because here is a clear statement says, I, I, I live of Columbia Pike, you <laughs> won't catch me there. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, the, the statement is, oh, I think that the threshold of you know, attention of you know, the, 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 the dial for, for, uh, for maintenance should be 80, 81 rather than 84. Do we, do we review that some, at some point? Do we say, well, we, we had a, the phenomenon, and Mr. Manager, you're absolutely right. People are giving us worse grades than our, our streets are objectively, right? And that's a problem. 
Um, but nevertheless, I mean, when do we calibrate that? I think we try to do it every paving cycle when they work through plans. I think they try to coordinate DES and with other partners on, all right, what else is happening? So there could be a, a street, as I understand it, where I live in Arlington, where Dominion is coming in and doing work, right? And if we are, let's say my street doesn't need to be repaved for four years based on PCI, but if Dominion is coming in to do work and they're gonna do it now, why would we not take advantage of that versus having, do you see what I mean? And so yeah, there yeah. could be, uh, so I, smart I think I said this like seven years ago, it's like an art, not a science. Do you see what I mean? It, it, there are so many factors. I know it's not perfect. Okay. That, uh, Understood. All right. We have really yeah. talked about paving a lot. Is there any more about paving? I will make just a quick, a quick comment in listening to all of this. Um, yeah, I did live through it when it was bad. I think it's a little bit like the broken window phenomenon. You know, for Arlington, so broken window, you know, you see too many broken windows and then things just go down because people think it looks unkept. And so we don't do broken windows in Arlington or anything, but in our kind of level of socioeconomic whatever, I think it's the state of the roads. People drive on them all the time and it's, that's they experience it all the time. I think it does a lot for people's sort of sense of how things are in the county. So you may get more out of it than just the, the paving you might think so. So I'm just tossing that out as an idea because I won't be here next year when you start to continue these discussions. Matt, anymore? But we, I only have one, to my knowledge, I only have one other question for the whole afternoon, which wow. everyone may be. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Make it good. <laughs> All right. I'm, and I've got three minutes. I mean, I've certainly had lots of emails and ideas, and, and I've tried to signal the, the different topics of interest. But the, just with respect to FAC, I really wanted to. And I don't know that I've raised this before, but I am interested in um, restoring the funding for trade and budget promotion in, in the advertising budget for AED. Um, okay, so we've left FAC. It's a it is double good. negative, it's restore, so yes. it's yeah. eliminate yeah. the reductions. and so. Uh, I just appreciate that, and um, I'm mindful that we also had our AED director who, you know, the, there's some recommendations in there that I do support that, that are some reductions, but I, this in particular is one that uh, I just wanted to thank you for that, and it, not too much in the way of comments or bullets on that one, but uh, I agree with that one, and um, I don't actually, maybe a point for clarification, is that a one-time or ongoing, um, how would you, score that or yeah, that was that's an ongoing okay I don't know where we're going to come out I, I could get there to ongoing I know I think you madam chair have some interest in this too and so I just wanted to thank you for that recommendation um, and I think that's it Okay, Susan, your light is still Actually, not can, finished paving. Okay, can you just clarify that recommendation because I read it the other way so you, you had to vote can, can you just clarify it so the double negatives keep us? <laughs> I may have gotten it all wrong. No, so we voted on whether we should recommend to restore it. Right. And, <laughs> and, no. and that vote didn't pass. Okay. Um, and it was, and I don't remember the vote here, but we we provided you with all those votes for, for transparency, and there's comments there. Um, there were a number of things that didn't pass that were sort of like, yeah, if we... We think these are these are worthwhile things, but this year is particularly constrained, and so some of the we, we tried to to make it clear that there are definitely a lot of things in there that um, were well, good you. investments, and that's that's one of the things that, that we talked about. But thank, yes, thank you for that's setting me good. straight, and uh, and this year is constrained. It's also been a year of some evolution on one time and a little bit on ongoing. And so that informs a little bit of my perspective, but thank you for clarifying and I'm sorry to have gotten my one comment incorrect. No, 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 it's fine. We'll actually even let you ask another question okay. if you want to, it's okay. <laughs> Takis. Yeah, um, I have to say I was a little bit surprised about how you treated the AHIP fund towards the uh, teen, uh, uh, I, I'm not going to ask you to elaborate on that. They just have philosophical problems with this. <laughs> Uh, the uh, the other thing that I didn't understand quite is the the proposal to reduce the uh, public electric EV charging effort. Um, 
with the caveat that we haven't seen the transportation. The, so it's not like we have a very good level of service with public, really accessible, visible uh, infrastructure uh, across town. We have a good count, but they are, you know, in, in parking garages where you have to pay to be there, etc. So this is not, it's not like public facilities are universally well served, etc. So what was the thinking behind that? So th th there was a lot on that caveat. Um, a lot of um, there. There was some some in the commission, and some in the commission didn't support this this reduction. But um, some in the commission are, are very supportive of uh, expanding EV infrastructure. It's just we would like to see a plan um, so that we're not. Um, we're not prematurely investing. And there's recognition that this is developing technology, that, um, you know, as someone said, we don't want to buy a bunch of Betamaxes. Um, you know, not that we think that they'll be incompatible with technology in the future, but it, there might be a cheaper way to do this. There might be a better model coming out. And since things are developing, and since we don't have the plan, it's sort of a, a lot of things together lined up for this recommendation. And since what we have isn't today isn't close to full. If it, you know, if we were looking at 50, 75 percent utilization rates of what we have out there today, that would be different. But we only have a third, you know, 33 percent utilization rates of the public ones, which are the cheapest ones. And so that sort of was like, oh, maybe we we don't need a huge investment right but, now. Uh, and that's for for Michelle maybe to to respond to. I think that the appropriation that you propose there is to get uh, uh, EV charging stations in more uh, public facilities, like here in Courthouse, like in down in Barcroft Sports Center and uh, Walter Reed, et cetera. So basically to equip uh, a, a good distribution in public facilities so that we see some up, uptake so that when you go there and you have an EV, you know that you can charge it so that it's available to you. So it begins to, to, to foster a habit to do that, right? Correct. The investment is in public facilities. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. If I could add something, I think also we were looking at, because I just had my briefing, my understanding is looking at um, placement in public facilities, but particularly in areas where people might not have their own. In other words, where you've got lower income, because a lot of places people can afford it, they can charge their own cars, there's a lot of charging around, and then there are other places where it's kind of a bit of a charging desert, and I assume that, I, I think we're trying to equalize that out with a little charging equity, if you'd call it, I guess. Is that a... I think that's right. I also think there's recognition that we have many renters and corridors who might not have it in their garages, and so I... Um, I think we always struggle with that. Is it all on 22204? But would there be a benefit if it's on, like we're looking at new chargers at Central Library, for example, right. where we have a ton of renters who may not have that infrastructure available to them? Just, I'm just yeah, to, exactly. To augment what yes, I'm saying. Yes, we're really trying know. to even out the, the availability, I think. Okay. Um, talk to Jim more. Uh, uh, no, not, not more than that. But I just wanted to point out there are people who are, I mean, we have an, an uneven use, for example, in Arlington Mill, it's far less because it's kind of, Nobody knows, but uh, in front of uh, the aquatic center, it's very well used. So, uh, so it's it's a fact of signaling availability where it's needed the most, and, and and I believe that this appropriation is specifically for that. Now, a good plan for everything else. Okay, more questions for our fac. I had a few. Um, I wondered, actually, Ms. Meredith. They're suggesting adding a person to your shop to focus on performance measures. Do you want to comment on that? Or I don't know if I should. I mean, I suppose people always want to have somebody more. I, I was impressed with all the work you did on performance measures, and it was kind of nice to say this would be nice. I mean, a lot of times people say, you should do such and such, but they don't actually help. You were giving suggestions, which I thought was good. So I don't know, Ms. Meredith, if you wanted to add, make any comments or not. We haven't had a lot of conversation about this, but I would say that if we were to add if we were, if the expectations were to significantly increase, we would need additional headcount. There is no more capacity on that budget to <laughs> you take on anything else. Okay, you've answered the question, I think. Thank you. All right. Um, you might give us a number later on how much that might be. I don't know that we're going to do that, but it would be good to know. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, on, when, when you talked about the behavioral intervention services and, and said, you know, it's critical, there's not really a replacement, what was the response you got from 
DHS, I think it was DHS. Did you get a response from staff on, the, on that? You sort of hear different things from different people about the importance of the program and whether it can be replaced and whether it's really there, what's that going on? Yeah, so we, um, I, I wasn't part of those and I'm not exactly sure what, uh, what the conversations were, were with staff. It, we did uh, watch the work session and we, we've read, you know, various people. I know I personally have, have read up on this service. And it, it was my understanding that the, um, that the intention was to replace this with services from within the school system mm -hmm. that would be, um, that could address potentially the children's behavior, but might be, but would be limited in addressing the caregiver's behavior. And the one thing from our, our research on, on this is that really seemed to make this pro, uh, this particular program very budgetarily efficient. They, they serve a lot of people and, and seem to be very effective um, with efficiently spending their money. And I think it's because they're training the trainers they're, they're training the caregivers, mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm, it's sort of mm -hmm. limited time training for a lifetime of caregiving um, to address the issues, and that's a very effective program. And what we understood, and I'm happy to be corrected on it, was that the replacement programs were going to be more targeted directly at the children's behavior and not training for the caregivers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's that's where that came from. And uh, apologies, I'm not exactly sure where. No, no, no. That's what the, you're you're volunteers after all. I don't know. Thank you. Um, Mark, when we get down to our own questions, I'll have some questions. I think you said Anita was going to be available to answer questions about it. I'm here. Hi, Anita. <laughs> Hello. So why don't we just, if we can, if we can just jump in right now, do you want to respond to what Ms. Ms. Burgess said? And is it? Yeah, sure. Uh -huh. um, I would have loved to have had a conversation with FAC, but they did not come to meet with the Department of Human Services. So, um, I'm, I'm assuming that they are making their uh, assessment of biz from what they heard from the budget session or issues that people raised in the community. In fact, biz has had a declining number of participants over the last five years. Um, and the it is not an evidence-based program. I don't want to disparage, but we probably should have handled this in-house several years ago. It uh, The people who are our staff are very nice, very experienced people, but it it's not staffed with people who are necessarily certified in behavioral intervention, and it's not an evidence-based practice. I do think, sure, parent coaching is important, whether or not the government should be the one to be the provider is an, is a question for you all to decide. There are other ways in which we could address parent coaching that are far more cost efficient because the program does cost $270,000 for about 90 uh, participants, which is about $3,000 per, uh, per family. They don't attend to the children, they only attend to the parents. There is no consideration of income, so we have a, quite a few people who have sufficient income to procure these services elsewhere. But for those who are low income, or especially those who have uh, children with special needs, if the board chooses to reserve some funds for uh, this type of uh, service, you know, my recommendation would be to um, that we would go out and look for some space availability and some evidence evidence based programs, either in the private sector or the nonprofit sector, and reserve some funding in order to uh, provide that uh, to the to parents who need it. Th thank you. That that is helpful. Um, you said some funding. What would you need to have a fairly robust program available for people who needed it? Well, you know, we estimated around $75,000. Um, I think that programs typically cost, we had we have a cost sheet, but I don't have it in front of me. They range from free to, you know, $200 per session, basically. Um, or so it, 
depends what what models you know there it's not going to be an apple to apple sort of conversion because we have a certain methodology and other folks will have other methodologies but there's a lot of material out there i was just looking at a resource directory of evidence based parenting programs and there are programs out there um we just have to do more to identify them. Okay, if we decided that we wanted to do parent coaching, so 70 I'm wondering if 75k you think that would be enough to do what you I mean, if, what you could if you replace it for, for starting i mean if we wanted to go beyond you know we would have to see if we if we need it if there was a sudden surge i would come back to the county manager and say it looks like we have a lot of interest in this and we'll need a little extra money or we'd have to take it from the bottom line either way okay if, if i could offer yeah like, i think yeah, it's one of these things where we've had a really great program that that's helped a lot of people we're in a different era why don't we add one-time funding so that we can reassess what is the mm -hmm. best practice going forward, do with some benchmarking, and then we come back to you like before the end of the calendar year with a plan. Like we think, we think uh, behavioral coaching support is an important service to provide to our residents, Michelle Cowan's kids, whatever I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, every, parent, every, parent every parent needs all of the above, right? Yeah, every parent I mean, needs help. I'm not that, that was like, don't, every, don't, every parent don't needs help. Yeah, yeah. Abuse but no, somewhat, seriously, yeah. like, I think what I've heard from you all is like, you know, our intent is on the right services to provide. How we get there should be like, let's be thoughtful about it. Let's right. do some interaction. Totally. Let's do some benchmarking. So one time funding and then we come back and that's always hard. We really struggle, but I think this is a modest amount. This is not one time funding for $2 million. It's one time right. funding for like a hundred. And then we come back to you next year and we say, we've done an assessment. We've benchmarked. We've talked to our stakeholders. This is the right program going forward. But the way we've done it in the past, doesn't seem to really fit the I, need I, I, of I, Arlington's mm -hmm, community mm -hmm, today, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. No, it totally um, does. Okay. And we can write up like guidance on that, right? Yep. Do you guys know yep. what I mean? Like we can well, do I got that, it. If that makes sense. I got we got it. Yeah. Thank you. I I really appreciate all of this. I think we will put something there. Tuck, did you want to have something we had? Oh, uh, I, I wanted to ask exactly what this means, one time funding. I understood that we are going to I mean that if I understand the recommendations that we would stand up a kind of a voucher program or something like that and we would benchmark that or would this uh, maintain service in house or would this be just to be determined and just put the, a dollar frame around I think that? it's a little bit TBD Anita and I have talked about this every day for the last three days and <laughs> along with a lot of other things and so I think we we risk risk coming to you and say it's a voucher program for this amount and that give us time to do the right thing but we will what we're committing to is to, we've also funded the current program, right, before some of these staff leave for the next six months. So we're not like getting rid of this program. Yeah, so it's gonna keep I mean? on for six months, because I know I'm some not sure staff six leave. months, yeah, I need somewhere. to be careful. Okay. I, I don't know the exact right. date, so I, don't, I, I realize people are watching this, but I think, I, I would hope stakeholders realize, we think this is an important service. Let's just figure out how to do it right in a different era, and yep. we promise to be back to you. Okay. So, so, and I don't in, know, Tom is a nimble frame that yeah. responds, and but yeah. with a clear idea of reform of the product. E exactly. Working on that. Yeah. Right. And there's sort of some transition time. It's not like it just. In transition time. Yeah. Okay. Anita, right? I think you should just. Sorry. Yes, I think we need to do some <laughs> research into what are the programs that are out there. Perhaps the ones that are on our sheet were not available. I apologize for that. That was the best information we had at the time. We need to do some more research. But whether it be through a contract with one provider, multiple providers, you know, I my basic thing is, yes, we know parent coaching is important. We don't necessarily have to do it in-house. There are resources in the community, in the let's say the larger community and um i think that the service is important but i don't support uh, continuing the way we've been doing it yeah i hear, hear you loud and clear um and i think we'll we'll get something in there and obviously everybody's overstretched so some of this money could be for a person to help you figure this out i assume uh possibly so anyway we'll try to give you some funds to to make it work mm -hmm. thank you Great, that was all very helpful. Um, 
I, on the, and I appreciate Ms. Burgess, your comments on, um, on APS um, and the structural deficit and making it more transparent stuff. And isn't there a counterpart? Do you not have, isn't there a counterpart in schools for, to FAC? Yes, we do. Um, we have, they have a buzz budget advisory committee. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I've actually been emailing and we're, uh, we're hoping to set up some, some joint meetings and, and talk. Excellent. Excellent. So I don't think I can tell you what to do, but I think that would be a really good idea. Okay. Um, I think, that I would think be a you really can good idea. tell us what to do. <laughs> we, we are here to give you advice. Maybe I can. Anyway, we think, yeah, work with them. I think that could be really good. <laughs> no. um, and then on, uh, just on, on the housing and eviction prevention, um, you know, I've just gotten a briefing. Staff is working out. There's some interesting, really interesting analysis coming out, which I think I'm sure they will share with you all when it's ready um, and would love your feedback once you get a chance to really dig into it because they're really doing some, so I think, some really good work in Great. that area. All right. Anything else for yes. I have a couple other real quick ones. Um, I had missed your recommendation for um, civilian personnel for community engagement and CPR training and stuff in the fire department. Is that already in the works? And we've talked about it on the police side of things, but are there any ability, is there any ability to offload some of the extensive training um, timing and continued vacancies? I'm going to have to get back to you on the specifics of that. I do know that the fire chief and I had had conversation. There uh, had been some programs that were available sort of off the shelf and using apps for residents mm -hmm. to do training. And we also have, I'm going to get the name of the program. I, I don't even remember the name of the program. We can follow up. Yeah. Um, and I think we can get back to you with an answer on that. Great. And then I just wanted to give a shout out to FAC for an incredible amount of work, um, but in particular for always and continuing to push us to look across departments. I think this board is really focused on that this year, um, and our staff has been um, doing so as well. And likewise, on the APS uh, structural questions, um, if, you wa if you watched the school uh, school board and county board discussion, I think we committed to spending all of our summer vacation together <laughs> solving um, all of this. So uh, it may be that, that, you know, know that we as boards, both boards are, are there to have conversation with both you and back, and I suspect some collaboration across the summer is gonna get us a long way. Yeah, great. So I really can't tell you what to do, but if I have three votes, I can to some extent, and you got two already, I think you're good to go. All right, anything else? Thank you, thank you so very much. This is really just great work, really helpful. Thank you. All right, colleagues, I think we are now on to just our questions for staff here, and I'll just see who'd like to start us off with any questions that you need to have answered before you feel comfortable voting or getting through our session on Tuesday. Right. First light, I, I, have an, I have an easy one, uh, hopefully. So we received, and I received a lot of advocacy, uh, DPR is the, 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 the department on the personal training program, et cetera. We had some conversation here. There is an insistence that says uh, that this, this program is paying for itself because the, the, the actual revenue of the program covers the, the cost of the program. Uh, what can we comment on that? Is that finally true or not? I, I, yeah, Jane is not online, but I think during her, our work session with her, she said that that is not currently yes. the case. It's not uh, fully recovering fees. And I'm gonna ask Emily or Richard, did we, did we include any information on follow-up on what that fee would have to go to in order to do a full recovery? If not, we can get that to you by Tuesday. Yeah, that would be helpful. Yes, yeah. because Cause, cause, know, yeah, we're hearing a, different things. We'd like I, to know what are the facts. I, I'm so. saying only because <laughs> the, the insistence or the, the advocacy came after the work session right. saying that this is not exactly correct. We that can get be. that information to you. It was um, a really high dollar amount. There's only about 60 participants in that program, and they don't participate every single day or every single week with a heavy FTE and overhead count. So when we did... Yeah, it's a big number and compared, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I'm, yeah, compared to private sector options, it yeah. would be really, it's, it's a heavy lift and it's hard to understand how a typical family could afford 
afford that level to keep it 100% cost recovery. In our fee pyramid, right, we try to say where or the policy adopted by the board is that individualized services are full cost recovery. We think personal training meets the absolute definition of personalized services since it's not, not running a rec class, not running anything. And so, I mean, I feel like I, I'm going to speak a little bit on term, but it was like three or four times what you could get at, a, at a, another private fitness facility. It was really significant. Um, and Matt and I have had some really great conversations about means testing. But then means testing just means the cost for others go up. And it feels like it is an exclusive use of public space for personal training uh, uh, that could be used when we're talking about, as we've all talked about, fitness for adults, for youth, for others, and what that takes from our community center. But we are happy to give you that information, just try to and, 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 offer some initial, initial thoughts and, on that. And, and this is why I'm asking whether it covers or not. So this is uh, the one. And I understand that uh, in, in all the frankness. Uh, I was impressed by the type of people who were advocating for that, were you know, uh, people who are in rehab, who want to be in the th social environment, who are you know, middle-aged or all over older, who want to be in a social environment that is com you know, more, more conducive for them, where they connect more in, in uh, special TJ, et cetera, where they, you know, they go also to the, to the uh, community center and they enjoy the offerings there, et cetera. So there was some additional you know, there are additional factors that uh, made her, their experience unique and therefore they care a lot about the program. But I, I understand that. Yeah. I, and I'll just say, you may not be able to answer this in a short period of time, but I'm, I find myself wondering if there's some kind of classes that you actually could, it could be a group that gets sort of the, 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 the teacher. Yeah, and I think, to call I think goes, Jane, goes Jane spoke to that, yeah. He's offering other opportunities. Yeah. I, did, I did want to add that, in, and Emily just told me, right now we're, we, we currently recover 18, that's 18% 18 of the cost of yeah. the program. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, it would be helpful, <coughs> excuse me, just it's in talking to just to make sure that everybody yeah. sees yeah. that. For us to have, a, if, if, if Jane's able to provide just a, a list a little bit about what else is available, which actually we can point people to. Okay, that would be great. More questions? Can yeah. I ask a follow-up on, on that one yeah, before no, we ahead, move on? Okay. Um, I th and I, I don't remember the code section or whatever, but some, someone brought this question up and I want to make sure that we've chased down the answer. Is, uh, is there a way that private providers are able to use our public facilities if they were to be registered or to pay a fee or something to that effect and, and might that be a transition plan? Sorry if it's already been answered. I don't think answered. it's code. I think it's policy. I think it's all about if we have personal trainers taking over yeah. county facilities, what that pushes out is broader use. I, I would, Langston Community Center, as an example, that APS owns, is widely used by both seniors and high school students from Yorktown. If it were all focused on personal trainers that could pay, I think you will be pushing young males from Yorktown out, mm -hmm. which is exactly diametrical of what we've heard from you all in terms of priority for youth services. And we already are working through, so I, I really think that's a major policy issue about private use of public space that is just not easy to be answered without extensive, if we made TJ all about personal trainers, you would push out all the seniors from there. I, I think that's a really, I'm sorry, I'm just, it's a very, very important policy issue that is not easy just to say, hey, open it up. Mm -hmm. it, it seems easy to people who want to, I, I totally get it. All right. Maureen. Yeah. New subject? Uh, new, new topic. <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, thinking about like cross-departmental and some of the, the trends or themes I've heard from um, some of our community engagement, um, thinking about how we market our programs and services uh, and, and two examples that I'll use that come to mind are STI and, and sexual health testing services, um, but also some of our DPR programs or library programs that exist. Um, they're there for people, and yet a lot of the target populations don't know about them. Um, is there 
a place in the budget we can point to where we do marketing. Obviously, CAPE, the community and public engagement team, is a huge part of that. But across all of our departments, you know, how do we think about that type of strategic marketing that gets the programs we have that we're spending money to provide into the faces of the people who we want to be using them? So, point taken, we can do a lot more there. There's no doubt. As part of our, um, when we started in particular with the youth on our tier two, tier three, kind of like those kids, right? What do we do for those most at risk? How do they know where to get mm -hmm. more Narcan? How do they know youth mental health first aid? How do we do that? So we've begun that, ACEs, Takis, you've been talking a lot about that, like that's just for families and, and uh, caregivers and all of that. Um, so what was included in the manager's proposed budget, as well as part of the 750 that was approved to close out, is some initial funding to begin those efforts. And CAPE and the CMO has been leading that with a bunch of departments, DHS, JDR, DPR, libraries, everyone to begin to get that word out. Um, including a public campaign on ACEs, as well as a, the beginning of a reorganization of the website for mm. youth services. It's a good start. Do we have more to do? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I, I, yes. Yeah. Yes and, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Um, and I feel like with the energy before Brian left, but Erica Moore in her acting capacity is taking this on. There's been a good group of community members who are trying to trying to help us figure out. And a lot of it is not just about what the government does, if the county does, if you will, or APS does. We're doing a lot of cross, um, a lot of cross. We're finally getting into peach jar at APS. Not, not entirely. I'm, I'm not going to tell you guys it's perfect. Yes. Like there's a lot more to be done. But how do we cross communicate on what they offer, what we offer? Um, but I think there's, but there's more to be done in terms of PSAs. You know, Matt and I have talked about like there's a lot more. So I think, what am I trying to say? Yes, of course, <laughs> <laughs> we want to do more. And I think we have a good. We 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 are beginning it, and I'm really thrilled. I really do think this this uh, collaboration with APS on the comm side, on the principal side, is it's working. These things take though a couple mm -hmm. years, but I. Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't, yeah. I don't know. I'm and I, and, I, and I did want to add one thing, because you and I had this conversation. You know, we have an engagement brigade with CAPE that actually goes out and we do a lot of pop-ups. And I, I appreciate, and I think it's been fantastic that the board set aside money for this and we have a lot of our staff going out and doing it. I think if it were as simple as us just adding staff and doing more on the governmental side, I would be thrilled, but it isn't that simple. And I related to you that I had been over at Columbia Hills about two weeks ago, meeting with a number of the residents there. And all of the programs that we do with the kids or the parents, they, they're they not hearing about that. That's not because we're not broadcasting it, it's because they are so busy with their day-to-day -day lives, getting two or three kids out the door, working two jobs, that we actually, the opportunity there is for partnership with organizations like APA and AHC and other, or other organizations in the community to be amplifiers for that as opposed to county staff doing it. So there is some room, I think, there for amplification. Yeah. But we've, oh, and we've also yeah. been, we, we do realize that pop-ups, meeting people where they are versus them coming to us is important. So when we put the funding in for the, um, you know, the additional youth uh, tier two, tier three, we had funding mm -hmm. for organizations. We, I think we do a fairly decent job as an example when we're talking about car-free diet, like they show up everywhere, right? You see a table at every event. And so we need to do the same for youth. And so that funding that we included in the budget included that same concept. like. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can talk about car free diet or art or bike and walk Arlington. There, there might be issues there, but like then there's another table or another place that says youth services, summer camp, right. you know, all that. Yeah. We're trying to get there. But but do we need to do more? You're right. Absolutely. I guess, I, I guess kind of my remaining organizational question is, um, you know, does the impetus for that action live in CAPE or does it live within the individual departments or, or doers of the program? I think it's 
I think it's both. I think, I don't know if we should be, my advice, my recommendation, yeah. you all can disagree, is that to, to say like it should be in one place or the other. We have really great outreach in DPR, libraries, and DHS, but then there's great in CAPE too. Mm -hmm. And so how, to say to you right now, yeah. like it should all be in CAPE and they do it all. Sometimes our colleagues in DPR, like they do awesome. If they're doing a pop-up for a new park, opening like it should be in dpr do you know what i mean i think i think there's been a nice um uh if you will it's not centralization but this really great federation of states that like you know that cmo brings together to talk to departments hey this is coming up who do we bring into that there was a really great um i don't know if any of you went to the this is anecdotal but i think it's really important when the youth point in time am i can you guys yeah, hear me? Yeah, yeah I'm just being loud, just loud <laughs> no. yelling at my kids. <laughs> um, um, when we did the youth point in time homeless count mm -hmm. back in January at Arlington Mill, while DHS led it, there were representatives from DPR, libraries, JDR, police. Everyone was there, and they connected like 80 families to services. I mean, and so I just don't know that to dictate like one place in the org mm -hmm. structure works. I think we're really working hard from a CMO perspective to keep that collaboration going, and it's 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 working, if you yeah. will. Do you know Do you know what I mean? No, that um, that's that's extremely helpful. I think it's just one of the places where it's hard hard within a budget framework to capture what is going on and where is it going on? <laughs> um, but I think you're right that while we're doing a lot, you know, it's a, it's a both and situation and there's, there's more to strategize on, but that's fine. And resources are always helpful, yeah. right? You know, I'm also really, I think we've struggled yeah. with, we're getting better, but we're not all the way there. The language translation is mm -hmm. a big deal. It's really expensive. We found some interesting ways. I mean, this seems like a small win, but it's a big win. You know, the fact that the summer camp catalog now can be read in four languages is, yeah. I think, pretty great. And I think there was, because of the work of Jerry Solomon, really, like, it's pretty cool. But to do all of that and more often, it's not it's not cost free. You know what I mean? Like, so I resources always help is what I would say. Yeah. But you. I think language translation, we have recognized and heard regularly. That's a big, big deal for mm. for you know, the community. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. Yeah. If I can follow up a little bit. Um, so you said resources are always helpful. I mean, part of this, you know, so do we put it in the budget? What I'm hearing is sort of, it isn't really about money. It's about working differently and that you're really working it through pretty well. Is there some place where it would be helpful, even if it's like one time with, with language services to do some pilots or something to figure out what's the best system to use? I'm looking at Mark, we put, a, we put a, of the money that the manager proposed for your consideration, we did put a fair amount for Communication yeah. engagement. I think it was around 100, and I don't have the number in front of yeah. me. But it was like it was it was a fair amount. A lot of it was one time. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, well, you know, well, so a yeah, little no, bit that's more fine. one so, time wouldn't hurt. I'm just going to say I, I'm not opposed to that because I think, and then especially as we figure out, so much of this is piloting and experimentation. Like what worked, yeah. what didn't. Right. You know what I mean? Can, like, and, can, and how do we do that? Yes. So. And I wonder if I was in budget direction. What I'm fine. This. <clears throat> You know, one of, a bunch of the issues, and we're going to get more of them, they're, they're so cross-cutting, so it's really hard to kind of keep track. Is it possible to have some sort of performance measure on, like, these pop-ups, like, the connect, capture, like, what happened at Arlington Mill? Is there some way to do that, and maybe at some point have a report yeah, I, back? Yeah, I, I think you, you, Michelle pointed out to that example where we had the number of families who signed up. Um, we w we track at pop-ups the number of contacts we have, and I wish, you know, I don't know if Eric is around, she could speak to this. Um, but making those contacts and then seeing if they're followed through to the very end is actually quite difficult yeah. to do. So that's one of the things I think that we're going to try to pilot with some of this money, but I, I honestly can't tell you that it's going to deliver what you're asking mm -hmm. for. Don't okay. know. I mean, I'm just feeling it's a way for us as a board to, and actually all of us, to figure out what really sort of is going on and if it's working. And, I, and to some extent, you know, there's what gets measured gets done. I mean, it sounds like people are doing incredible work, but we just hear about it here. I mean, some people know about it, but there may be some ways to elevate it and, and make it more um, more public and more more known, which would be helpful too. Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions, Matt. I think it's your turn. Thank you. Um, just a concluding couple of thoughts, at least from my part. You gave me the second chance. I know so I'm gonna you're take really going to. Then you're going to conclude. So, okay. Um, I think it would really help between now and Tuesday, and I'm not sure that I surfaced this. I'd love to see if I can find a little bit of 
maybe Ms. Bird and Ms. Flanagan Watson's time on housing. I, I, I don't know if that email got sent, but I don't want to not say it. Um, and so that's one thought. The second thought is um, try to do some math to see about, and I know that I think on Tuesday typically you do a presentation to kind of give some a little bit of context. I don't know. If, I think that's still the plan, right? Well, the plan would be for the chair to do a presentation, and yeah. we would assist in walking you through and telling you that you don't have any more money to do what you want to do, or you Unless you take this out, right. and then you do. <laughs> Fair we, enough. We, we, so, we sort of group play with the so spreadsheet. The question is a little bit about, um, because of the, since our work session, there's been a couple of changes in one time and some ongoing adjustments. And so I kind of want to check my math to see if I understand where the APS budget might be, because that seems very relevant to me. The way that I count the math, I think we, I still believe there's a structural budget problem, but I do believe that some of the thing, things this year could be addressed. And I'm trying to weigh um, our responsibility to be good budget stewards with that. And so some, I don't know who would do it, but some sense of that, whether that math is right and or you know the typical type of slides that sometimes we see in the introduction. Right, so one, one thing we can do, and I, I'm gonna encourage Richard and Emily if they have the information now, they may not, but <laughs> with the additional money that we provided with uh, our mid-year process and the one-time funds that were available to schools, and I think that was around six million, and then the additional about 1.7 or 8 million in ongoing, and another 1.3 million. So it, it, it essentially, there was about another $10 million in money put on the table from when you met jointly with the school board. And we can put that number and and we have the slide that schools talked about, what would happen if they got the money? And again, I can't speak to how they'll use the one time or the ongoing money. Did you want to add anything on that? Exactly. Okay. We right. don't know utilization. Yeah. Got so it. we won't know the utilization, but at least I would say that, you know, the superintendent laid out. And, and frankly, if I, if I could give you more, if anything, it's become less clear what's going to happen at the state level yeah. um, since then. So. Well, certainly Metro, we've been thinking about that too. but. Um, I guess I would say that um, that that would be immensely helpful, and um, you know, it's also the case that we've learned that the tax rates that adjoining jurisdictions that were suggested in that presentation have not all been reached. I think Fairfax was in that slide deck estimated to be higher than it actually will, and that's I think relevant because we all want to uh, do what we can. But yeah. that's so. Yeah, so, and let, let me and. and Richard and Emily, you have to weigh in here. That's why you're sitting at the table. We can send you a select number of slides that we used in the earlier presentations and update them. Um, that would really exactly be the goal, so people for. can compare it. Because yeah. it's much easier for us to do that than write sort of a, a whole bunch of words for you. Yeah, that's super helpful, um, and I'm mindful because so much of the public testimony was with respect to our schools, and just we can't. You know, but so an, but, yeah. an update on school. I, th I yeah. hear you, and also on what our our partner, you know, our regional jurisdictions yeah. are and then doing. Our neighbors, Madam Chair, and just um, I always say that I'm going to be more disciplined and know that it's all going to work out in the end. And I always send an email at six in the morning that says I'm worried about these three issues. <laughs> but I don't read it until midnight. Yeah, and that's true. <laughs> but that's that's and then I'm asleep or trying to take care of. But I just I do want to. Um, sort of ask for grace, forgiveness, if I um, don't re remember that it, that all of the questions almost always get answered, even if they don't get answered at 6.30 in the morning. So my apologies. No, that's <laughs> fine. All right, so some update slides would be really good, and as much as you can get a sense of what's happening with schools. So can I ask, um, in your recommendations, you had, I think it was about $4 million uh, as a potential ad for PAYGO. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got to that? I think there are a number of us interested in sort of multi-year climate investment, and is that going to scratch that right. itch so, or not? Yeah, and I think I've talked to each of you about that, and I, I want to state unequivocally for the public record that $4 million is probably the wrong number. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but in the conversations you had, especially the last work session we had around PAYGO, and also the conversations around our environmental programs, there was a desire expressed on the part of the board 
Okay, well, maybe we, we appreciate you putting money in for the Climate Action Fund, and there may be additional ideas that come up during the conversation around CIP. Would there be funding available for it? And I know that people think when you're talking about the CIP that you're, you're appropriating billions of dollars over the next 10 years, but the fact is the, the only real money you have is what goes through this process. So setting aside a few million dollars for that, we thought was appropriate. And without saying explicitly what it's going to go for, I think those can be continuing conversations. The other thing is, you also heard from our facilities design and facility maintenance staff. There are, and you've heard, we've had, you've had conversations with some employees saying, you know, a fresh coat of paint or doing something with finishes in a building. And we are, I, I will say, we are not funded at the level I think that we need to be for that. So that is meant to include money in there. If you took that number from 4 million to 3 million, would I say you're wrong? No. If you took it from 4 million to 5 million, I wouldn't say you're wrong either. But that's just a sense of a scale of what we were thinking. Great, thank you. Um, in one of the answers back about transportation, I think it was um, highlighted that we're eliminating buses and combining buses. Someone had asked the question about whether a microtransit pilot might be appropriate to align with that, and the answer was they can't be aligned because it'll take us 12 months to do the microtransit pilot. Can you say a little bit more about that and whether we have any flexibility of doing a pilot pilot or uh, somehow getting those to align so that the handful of uh, riders that are about to be inconvenienced, we don't lose them back to the single occupancy vehicles. Yeah, that's a comment. You do and it can be offline too, but I just wanted to stitch that together. Um, yes, I've been talking with DES about how can we um, consider doing something that's not 12 months, but something shorter. I think we do need some period of engagement and analysis for a micro transit and what it looks like in getting a possible vendor or fleet in place, Susan. So I, I'm i with you. I just don't know that it can be stood up in two or three months without some level of, of study, if that makes sense. I just, I, I think to get uptake or, or to do the right thing that's effective will take a little bit more time. So I, I don't know if that's helpful, but I, I, I think that's where we're at. Great, we're thank at. you. Uh, I think there's also been conversation, um, and you'll probably get some of these recommendations next week, but uh, as the home ownership study is, is about to wrap up, um, there's a sense that there may be some, some additional funds there to pilot things, to invest in new offerings. Is there a order of magnitude that might be good for that set aside? The short answer is, you know, I've received an initial briefing on this. I haven't received the final briefing. We sent them back to do some more work. I am anxious about putting a specific number there. And so I think what you're pointing, what you are so thoughtfully pointing out is that sometimes our budget timeline does not neatly mesh with the information we need in order to do it. So one of the things the board could do is not allocate all the money we put on the table for one time, leave a pot unallocated, and as we go forward, as we get to close out, which is um, how many months from now? October. It's like, yeah, it's like five, five or six months from now when we have answers, then you could provide guidance there. Now, what you also could do is provide guidance to us to come back once the study is completed with a more precise number. But if you've left some funds alloc unallocated, that allows you to do that. So um, I'm not going to give you a specific number right now because I just don't feel that level of confidence. Okay, great. Okay. So the last one is on bonuses, if no one else I don't is going to ask it. At the but I don't see any lights on. Go for it. Um, so I think there's also been lively conversation around the table about making sure that especially our um, uniformed and frontline uh, folks have bonuses. And I know that there's a number of places where we do work to take care of them within the collective bargaining agreement. Can you just share for... Sheriff, police, fire, behavioral health, um, where we are in the macro and where, what degrees of freedom are reasonable to consider or not. Right, I'm gonna do this in two parts. I'll start with the first part. I'm gonna ask Michelle maybe to lay in on the second part. In this fiscal year, fiscal year 24, we've had a, 
we have rolled out using funds available in the police department a bonus uh, hiring bonus program and also a re uh, money for retention. Okay, that's in fiscal 24. We don't, um, and Michelle can talk a little bit about what we're doing in the Department of Human Services. I'm gonna talk about public safety. We don't have anything similar to that with the sheriff or fire. One of the things I would suggest to you is that bringing a program like that to the sheriff's office and the fire department would be good. I think you need to keep in mind, I know Matt, we've talked about this, that we probably, I would think we would wanna keep that going for police in 25. But the goal here really is, is very specifically to try to use these incentives to help with recruitment. First off, I think it's probably a good idea, but secondly, because all our regional partners are doing it and we're sort of losing out in that competition. I'll let Michelle talk a little bit about the behavioral health world. So in the, yeah, in the world of DHS, um, we have been offering, let's talk about recruitment and then retention. We have been offering a recruitment bonus to frontline behavioral health workers, not all CSB, not all behavioral health, but those who are truly frontline. As you know, I think you know, right? We do have 24 seven behavioral health support in DHS, just like public safety. The structure of that bonus has been $3,000, 1,500 up front, 1,500, right? To keep you, you have to stay for a year, right? <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, we know that we're falling behind in comparison to other jurisdictions, in particular Fairfax, who are offering, I think it might be 10 to 15,000. What the manager has proposed in the most recent markup is in bumping that from three to five with that same structure of now and later to keep people focused. We think our benefits also keep people here is what we do from a, just a general, how DHS manages their staff. From a retention perspective, we've been having ongoing conversations with DHS about, well, what does what makes sense? And I'm not sure it makes sense, honestly, to be all of behavioral health. I think it's frontline again. And so what I, I think we'll be coming back to you all with the recommendation is a pool of money to recognize those DHS workers. DHS, it's not just behavioral health. There are a number of groups who are 24 seven. If you need assistance after hours, it's not always on behavioral health, it's on other services. So I think we are trying to figure out what to propose to you in terms of providing what I think what I what I think I understand from the board of policy perspective is public safety is 24 seven, but we also know that DHS variety of services are 24 seven and how do we reward those employees at the same, do you follow, you follow me with the same equity? And so, but working through that with Anita's seven or 800 employees is just taking a little bit more time. And then, and then to be honest, how do you manage that with that staff? Like, why is one person getting a bonus and someone next to them isn't? So we're just trying to be thoughtful about that to make sure that you know all that works. If that if that's helpful, I hope that's helpful. That's what we're working through. Thanks. Thanks. Let me, let, let's Susan finish and then I'll get oh, right to you. you. Know, let Susan, it's okay. Talk is no, did you have a follow-up It is on this, no? exactly no. this point though. Okay. I mean, just as a follow-up, because I understand mm -hmm. that uh, I, I fully understand the front front facing and the 24/7, yeah. but there's also a rotating personnel there that is sometimes front facing. They rotate in, they rotate out, so they they, they would be included, right, in in the thing. Yes, right? that's right. And then we also, as an example, DES or D DES DHS. Um, um, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so emergency services and the Behavioral Health Bureau CSB, we offer already bonuses, if you sign up for third shift, you get an extra $300. That's how we encourage people to do that. So we already have that baked into the budget. So what I'm yeah. trying to say is talk is, yes, yeah. we are. I mean, I always understood that. that the, for example, the social workers in the jail, they are they are right. heavily incentivized, so. Yep, okay. that's right, you're right. It's you not right. like this is completely novel. We have been facing the problem before and we have been answering it It's this a big, way. yeah, it's a, yes, okay. yes. Did you hear more? Yeah. I did. Um, so final category, I promise, um, is other places we could save, right? So uh, we, actually our former board asked you to go and scrub the budget and all of you have been working diligently for six months to do so. Um, but community members and new board members uh, continue to brainstorm and, and look and try to scrub as well. So um, A, thanks for your patience. Uh, but B, there are two items I just wanted to elevate and, um, and make sure that I'm understanding them well. Uh, one is the ASAP program, the alcohol safety 
something program mm -hmm. run, I believe, in the sheriff's office. And I think during the presentation and the performance metrics that were presented, um, it did look like the participation has fallen off quite extensively, which also means the revenue has fallen off. And I know we have some space constraints, so there's a cascading question. Um, and I uh, just raised that, um, how do we chase down whether it is possible to, uh, over time, right-size that? I think that's you know a program that's run, I mean, previously, historically, was run by the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, and in most other jurisdictions was run, is it, and still is run by the Commonwealth Attorney's Office in those jurisdictions. It was transferred to Sheriff, I don't know, like 10 years ago or something. Um, I really think that is a discussion that I've started based on your inquiries, um, Ms. Cunningham, to have with the Sheriff, but in particular, the GDC and Circuit Court judges who view that as an appropriate diversion versus detention. So I we will do our we will do our level best to help facilitate what that means. I think when I talk to some of the sheriffs or exchange emails with some sheriffs folks today, like I think the staffing at seven actually might not be that. It's at six. And I would also note they're all civilian and not uniformed. So the cost differential, do you guys follow me, is a little bit different. Um, so Totally hear you. Will help facilitate that conversation among your elected and constitutional colleagues. Maybe, maybe they can teach CPR for the fire department. Mm -hmm. Women. Can okay. I follow, can I follow up? Yeah, please. Yeah, no. And on this program, I know there's um, issues about space and people trying to discuss the space. The final decide decision rests with the courts on exactly how. Is that correct? I mean, we could put money in for something, but if they didn't want to do it, it wasn't going to happen. Is that correct? You know, and so you're asking me, if, is there something written down in the Code of Virginia or the Arlington County Code that says that the chief judge or the uh, county board gets to decide how space is used in the court's police facility? There is no such document that exists. The practice has been that um, we work closely with all our partners uh, in the circuit court, general district court, um, with, and I know I'm leaving other people out when we've had conversations about what is going to happen in that building. We had a pretty lengthy process that settled upon a number of capital improvements over a period of years. And what has happened is that that plan, I think, which is a really solid plan, we've sent you copies of it. As you go along and you have new people who come into the conversation, they raise questions which I think are legitimate about, well, what about this? And given the change in the way work is being done, those conversations, from my mind, are best held among all the interested parties. Um, and I think that that's a conversation we think right now that is taking place. We know the chief judge has reached out to the Commonwealth's attorney, to the sheriff, and to the clerk of the circuit court to have those conversations. It's my understanding, when, especially when it comes to the ASAP program and how that interacts with the Commonwealth's attorney, there is an idea that perhaps there could be some small space reduction more immediately that would allow more space for the Commonwealth's attorney. But some of the longer term um, solutions we laid out, which I'm going to get wrong, I think it was on the fourth floor of the court court um, over the long term still may be the best way to go given everybody's interest in that. I don't know, Michelle, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I think that's right. I think you remember from the last two CIPs and referenda, there's like a 10-year plan. I mean, the hard part, right, is this is like, what was that phrase, fixing the airplane while it's flying? Do you see what I mean? Like, we have to provide these services. And I think there was a consensus when um, DES with the partners of Circuit Court, JD, GDC, JDR, Commonwealth Attorney, police, all of them decided, like, they looked at the building and said, sort of horrible. What are our biggest concerns? And everyone agreed that the biggest concerns were the fourth floor where JDR is, where the setup of this courthouse from 25 years ago had victims and Children. perpetrators, yeah, the abusers. Yeah. 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 I'm not using, right, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to use the appropriate, like, in the same spaces with their, or, and then also JDR also does domestic you know, DV and SV, yeah. right? You know what I mean? And so I think there was, and I, what I love about, right, and I'm not trying to be all whatever, but like what I love about Arlington is everyone in that building came together and said, if we're going to fix anything, we're going to fix the fourth floor. This is not a good situation. And so that is what is a contract you approved two months ago. That is what's happening first. In terms of 
the Commonwealth Attorney in ASAP space, that long-term plan, and this was anticipated, we had it in 26-27, the CIP, which is, yeah, absolutely, the Commonwealth Attorney needs more space, better space, ASAP should move, and we can move it to the second floor of the building. And what's great about that is, is it, more, it has a better nexus to GDC, which is the majority of where those DUI cases happen. It was just going to be a little bit later. But that said, exactly what Mr. Schwartz said um, is that we understand there have been different pressures on the Commonwealth attorney. So, but how do we, you know what I mean? Like, how do we meet all that? So I think there's a general sort of perspective. Let's stick with this long-term plan that had every stakeholder agreeing we didn't get everything that we wanted, but we have a consensus on our priorities. And then let's see what we can do in the interim. I think this idea, as Mark said, of maybe consolidating a little bit of the ASAP space is a really good one and gives some breathing room for the Commonwealth attorney. And then what we're trying to work through now, as I think you all are meeting with um, Chief Wheat, or uh, Judge, Judge Wheat, Wheat, sorry, mm -hmm. Chief Wheat, Judge <clears throat> Wheat, um, about that, I think will then help us figure out how much it costs. I do think from a budget perspective, we'll need some one-time funding. And then I would just, I'm hopeful that when we're looking at the CIP upcoming, that we continue on this path. It's hard. It's hard, I realize, for all of us to say, investing in a 25-year-old building, why do we need to do it versus a park or otherwise? But we do, you know? Like, oh, yeah. I think that's a real, you'll hear a lot about those old buildings. So in any event, I, I don't know if that's Thank helpful. Thank you. The only thing I would add, if, you, if you've all been on tours of various parts of that building, including the jail, if that building were built today, it would be built very differently. And so flying the plane, trying to fix it, it's, there are some real challenges in that building. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Listening to all of the stakeholders, not sure that's someplace I particularly want to wade in. All right, thank you. Any, um, I'm Susan, I think I interrupted right, my, you. Sorry. My last lightning round <clears throat> is um, obviously everyone asks the questions, there's vacancies, can we eliminate them? Um, and so can you decode uh, how we account for vacancies and we do take those savings even though it's a little hard to read in the budget because yes. you, you stumped me on that one, um, but I got a good explanation I, I, yesterday. I'm happy to do that, and I pre <clears throat> I, when I say I appreciate getting questions from the board, 75% mm -hmm. of the time I mean it, but this time, <laughs> this time I really do mean it. <laughs> no, I'm just going to say is that we get questions. We And I'm going to ask Emily and Richard to walk through a little bit of uh, the conversation we had the other day. You know, when we are putting together the budget, people uh, should understand, well, we sit with each of the departments and they come in and we, not every year, but most years, we ask, I ask for a list of all vacancies in the department and I ask a for a list of how long the position has been vacant, what is going on with that specific position by way of recruitment, and there you get into this conversation sometimes, I'll say somewhat glibly to a department director, that position's been vacant for two years. You've been doing a really good job. You don't need it, right? And I, sometimes department directors will use some choice words explaining to me why I have that all wrong or that they've been in the process of recruiting for a service that they've found it very, very difficult to um, bring people in. Um, one of my favorite examples is with crossing guards. We have for years run a number of vacancies in crossing guards. I will tell you right now, if we could fill those up immediately, there would be a use for every single one of them. Okay, so. PSA. Yeah, there, there really would be. Get a so, cool vest. Right, so it's a, it's a balance uh, of trying to do that. Having said that, we do an analysis, we look back on history, and we try to determine in each department what we think is going to be the savings associated with the lapse in hiring. And so I'm gonna ask Emily and Richard to, sh to walk through how we actually do that in the budget and where it shows up. Yes, thank you. Um, so each year as we're developing the budget in the fall, we take a look at the vacancies as the manager mentioned. We also take a look at the personnel savings that each department has generated over a multi-year period. So like our spreadsheet for the FY25 analysis goes back to 18, because we want to make sure we're taking into account pre-pandemic trends and not those pandemic trends where we definitely had more vacancies. So we take a look each year at those numbers and we look and see, you know, did the department meet what we call the credit for turnover, which is that, that vacancy savings or not. 
And if they did, and if they exceeded that savings by a certain amount, by a reasonable amount, we'll look at increasing the factor that's used to calculate that vacancy savings. There is a negative budget in the personnel budget for almost every department to account for that vacancy savings. It ranges from 1% to 5%, depending on what kind of pattern of savings we've seen in the department over a period of years. In FY25 budget, there's over $13 million in the general fund and vacancy savings, a negative $13 million. Plus, there's a $3 million negative budget in non-departmental to account for any additional vacancies we might see across different departments where we just don't know where they're going to be happening, right? We don't know who's going to have trouble hiring, where we're going to see significant vacancies, so we add that additional $3 million. So there's a total of over $16 million of like a negative adjustment in the personnel budgets across the general fund in the fiscal 25 proposed budget. Great, thank you. I think that's really helpful because it um, it was a little hard to see the magic in the spreadsheets underneath it all. Um, but I think we we do know that there are vacancies, um, but the, it's important for the community to know that we're not paying full freight for those vacancies. We're, we're holding those FTE because we do think we'll need them eventually. But the budget and the tax rate reflect that we have uh, captured some of those savings. So thanks for all the math. It's very appreciated. Right. Okay. I had a few questions, and I'll go around and do another run. Did you have something on this, Douglas? No, no, no. Okay, I'll just, I think I have a couple of quick ones. Um, we've talked about stipends for election workers, or rather um, the registrar did when she was here. Um, I'm not sure if that's what we want to do on, you know, forever, but I'm thinking this is going to be a difficult election year coming up. I'm wondering if we might ask the registrar to sort of what kind of a bonus for election workers this year, possibly, and I was, I'm thinking one time, is that something we could ask her, or maybe you have that information? Yeah. So I don't have information on a particular bonus, but we did go back to the registrar and talk about changing what the poll worker pay might, might be. Yeah. So right now, the poll worker pay is um, just about $12 an hour is what it works out to, and they do that based on an average number of hours, right? If we were to increase that to thirteen fifty an hour, it would cost about fifteen thousand dollars. Okay. Um, so not that would not break the bank most likely. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and then there has been some, some people written in about there's a, an adult probation program. I think it's regional. It, 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 I think Mark, we just discussed that. Could yeah, you explain that to me? Yeah, and and I think we're we're talking about District Ten, which is the state level that deals with probation, they, you know, it's been two years since I've met with them. They send in a letter every year that talks about how they would like a supplement uh, to their budget. And they did send us a letter this year. We did not include any of that in the budget. Um, I think when we were talking earlier today, and I don't know if we have that information handy. We don't have it handy with us right now. We'll get back to you with an answer. We have, and I just want to make sure, and I'm going to help the, everybody here help me with this. We have for our public defender, for the sheriff, I'm thinking of all the places where the state provides funding. Um, the county, I think generously and also necessarily provides supplements because of the cost of living. And so that is one of the things that I think that's in there. We'll take a look at it. I, I will always say that they do incredible work in that office. Um, part of the question I've always had is how much does Arlington contribute to District 10 as opposed to the other jurisdictions? Because I think we should do our fair share and I don't have enough of a sense about how our partners in District 10 are doing. So we'll get information back to you by Tuesday. That would be that. very helpful to have to see whatever other folks are doing oh, there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's a, this time they pulled me over and so I followed up on the letter and huh. 25 positions, six vacancies, and so that's part of what led me to have more interest. If they had vacancies. The six right now, it's more than uh, Ms. Perez has ever had, and that's, in addition to the letter, that's what led me to say that the 78,000 in total seemed worth it. Okay, all right, thank you. And and yet those are, those positions are also funded by other- State, uh, yeah. State, okay. Oh, but we, yeah. Other partners, too. So, yep. yeah. Well, anyway, a little more information on that over the weekend would be great. Thank you. And, and thank you, Matt. Um, just want to confirm the Safe Haven program. I know we're waiting to hear on a grant. If it doesn't come through, we'll figure out something. That, and better to not jump in right there. Um, I have a few more, but I'll stop right there. Takas, did you have something more you want to? Just briefly, but uh, you can follow up. I mean, f continue. And I have only a question on, 
on the take home vehicles. And Go ahead, oh. ask it. You, you so, know that, that I had shared that information with you? Yes. Yeah, I wanted to, so we had a conversation with, I, I talked with Chief Penn, I also talked with Randy Mason, the head of ACOP, because anytime we're talking about benefits, we get into that yeah, question. So uh, it turns out that in the police department right now, and the number is not exactly fixed, but as of right now, there are about nine or 10 positions that serve in the role as sergeant that do not have take home vehicles. Okay, so what that has meant is a number of uh, people in the police department who are fully qualified to apply for the sergeant's exam and are currently lieutenants or below and have take home vehicles <laughs> will not apply because even though it's great to be a sergeant, apparently it's even better to have a take home vehicle. Um, so what has happened is the promotion process has been somewhat skewed mm -hmm. where we don't have all the best talent applying. Yes, and the yes. fact is, is that if we add another nine or 10 vehicles, th these would be well used, okay? These would be people who would be on call, who would come back. It would also improve the, uh, the upward mobility and believe it or not, the recruitment in police because word about this gets around in our sister jurisdictions. Now we had been asked earlier, what would it take to give everybody who lives outside the county, who works for the police department, a take home vehicle? And that is a number that I can't even comprehend. Okay. But this is a more precise number meant to address a specific issue. Yeah, I understood that. I just didn't know what what is behind that. I mean, what is the effectiveness of, right. of the, it's not a trivial amount. It's, it's no, it is not. No, it's not a trivially effect either. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Incentives are always important. Um, one qu on the, you know, we've been talking about the NOFA, um, and can, could we have information about um, if we go down lower on the on the list, um, and maybe fully fund, and also perhaps do fifty percent of those that, that didn't make the cutoff? Just a few options. I don't know if colleagues have any other options they'd like, but I think we would like to have that. That would be very helpful. Yeah, we can provide that to you. And I did. We'll talk a little bit about the mechanics on this. We have to see if we can get this information to you all. Obviously on Tuesday you're having the markup. We'll try to get it to you by close of business Monday. We'll see what we can do. Yep, but so we have, we have okay. a lot of that and information. And this would be one time because they're grants, is that right? Right, the, the racial equity NOFA is funded with one-time funds. I think I'm gonna have it wrong. Was it 1.5 million? And then right. um, we have the number of applicants. We have these numbers. We just need to go back and do some quality yeah. checking right. on it. Right. Right. No, that, that would be very helpful. Excuse me? I, I think some of them have been sent some, some of it was sent to, we, we, I, I think you had asked another iteration of yeah. it, but we have that. It's always just nice to kind of do another pass through and make sure oh, the wait. numbers. Cause okay, numbers. I take it back. It's ongoing funding. It's meant to be ongoing funding. Okay. The, but, the appropriation ahead. is ongoing funding, but anything above that. Right, right. Time. But I'd say this in the discretion of the board, depending on how you want to treat this as a pilot or anything like that, it's okay, everything's going to be fine. We'll figure it out. <laughs> I like the one time treating as a pilot and we may look through things. Um, yeah. Go ahead, talk us okay. anything else? Nope, okay. Um, one last thing I want to check, and I think I've asked this many times, and I think I keep getting the answer and forgetting it. Um, Solar panels on Lubber Run, I know we're kind of trying to work through that, and I think we're doing some solar panels. We're hoping to do them down at Trade Center. Is that CIP? I'm assuming it's CIP. All right, so I, I just say one of my favorite moments during the budget work sessions was when we were, when Greg was in here talking about <laughs> Lubber Run and putting solar panels on it. And I, you know, I actually can read all of your eyes very well. Everyone. And, 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 and Matt, Matt did one of his like eye motions, then he sent me an email, he goes, Get it done, get it done. And we're, we still have to, please get it done. We're still working through that second part where we, you know, I would just say, we still are gonna work with the uh, partnership that Dominion's put together. I will be the first to tell you that we would be wrong to rely on the fact that that will come through for us. So that's one of the places where we've set aside some of that money in um, pay go for the CIP where you could look to do it. Well, I, I don't think we actually have, do we have a dollar estimate about what that would be? We don't have costs yet, but I think in part, when you all asked about why did we set aside four million in PAYGO, it's so that we have flexibility to deal with that, and then we often hear about other transportation safety issues, you know, just trying to make sure we can be um, fleet, if you will, and respond and agile and responding and not come back to you and say, we don't have money or we have to defund another project or delay another project. I, I right. really, I, I hope, Four million in terms of 
a capital asset base of yeah, four trying billion. to make government but, uh, you know, I, did, I do want to say there's I don't think there's that much more time we have to wait till we get the anticipated answer that we're going to get and that we would then move ahead and on our own we have not procured those kinds of systems on our own in the past we would figure out how to do that so it'll take a little I mean, time we did very limited it the new fire station eight where we both have a small green roof and some small solar panels but it's not something typically you know we've generally used public private partnerships but hear you i'm not yes yeah. we're moving into a hear new you. year yeah Close. thank you all right um any other questions colleagues mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. all right i had one general one because i know i think some folks are thinking about this don't know whether that will happen um if we wanted to use some one-time money to get sort of a larger program going and have it not for one year but for three years, is that possible to put in it and make it like a three-year grant or three-year pilot that we fund this year? So anything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> anything. Yeah, pretty much. You just say yes. We can it suspend. Might not be wise. We can suspend the laws of physics. We have a lot of uh, we have a lot of important abilities here. It's but, a lot uh, of power. <laughs> you know. So in the past, the board has uh, offered money for program used one time money over a two year period, and there may be examples beyond that. I just I can't recall any. So the challenge with that, and it's not. That's not an, a challenge you can't overcome, is if you put one-time money in for a program over three years, I know what happens in year four. Everybody assumes it's ongoing, okay? So that becomes about a budget challenge in the out years, and so we have to be careful about how we do that because the rating agencies are always focused. Are you doing ongoing programs with one-time money? So we have to be careful about that. This board's been very careful about that. Um, the idea is if you want to set aside money if you want to do it for two or three years, I would just say, please put in a check-in after year one that says, this is how the program's doing, because you want to make sure, I know what you're saying is you want to put in the money to show your long-term commitment to it, but it can't be seen as, uh, I would call it a pilot plus. You're doing a pilot, and then you want to make sure you're showing your commitment, but you have to check in after the first year. And we have in the past, when we've had programs with one-time money for more than one year in tough budget circumstances, the people over on my left here strip it out of the budget and we come back to you and say, yeah, okay, we dare you to add it back in. That's the kind of conversation we have. But there's, there's no prohibition about doing it. No, that's very helpful and I, hope, I, I appreciate the suggestion. We'll see, we'll see where we come. But, uh, and I'm very mindful of the fact that I don't, I'm not going to have to be here when the chickens come <laughs> home to roost. So, all right. Any any more questions? Thank you Ask now sure. or forever hold your peace. <laughs> I think we're good. All right. Thank you all very you so very good. much. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Our question is very <laughs> just as long as you read every one of them. I think we're allowed to go home before five. I believe. I think I simply adjourn the meeting. I think we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>